Okay, good afternoon, everyone. This is Sue Strader, and welcome to Grand Rounds. We have a nice little group in the auditorium. Thanks for coming down, and I'm fairly sure our wonderful residents are going to be popping down here any minute. I want to remind everyone that we have no grand rounds next week or the week after. So that's the 21st of December and December 28th. There will be no grand rounds due to the holidays. Grand rounds will resume on January 4th, 2023. And we hope you all have very happy holidays. So with that, I am going to turn over this. Uh, oh, and welcome to everyone on Teams. And um, I don't even think I need to remind you by this. I'm sure you already know, but make sure you're muted when you join us. Make sure that you mute yourselves. At the end, we're going to do Q&A. And uh, we are going to try something different today to make sure that all of the People on teams can actually hear the questions that are being asked, because I know we struggle with this. All right, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Madsen, who is going to be introducing our wonderful speakers for today. Thanks. Happy holidays, everyone, and welcome to the last Grand Rounds of the year. All right, <clears throat> today is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sandberg and his colleague, Shelley Daub. Now, Dr. Sandberg graduated from Brigham Young University with degrees in biochemistry and Russian. If you ask him nicely, he will do the accent for you. He received his medical degree from the University of Arizona and completed pediatric residency at Nationwide Children's Hospital at the Ohio State University, then went on and completed fellowships in pediatric gastroenterology and pediatric health services research in Ann Arbor, Michigan at the University of Michigan. You can imagine that game is a very conflicting time for him. He also earned his master's in science and health and health services research, taking coursework with the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars. And he came to Dayton Children's Hospital in 2014 after being recruited by Dr. Adam Mezoff. Dr. Sandberg currently serves as a local physician lead and national uh, learning, learning lab leader of Improve Care Now, an international quality improvement learning collaborative. He serves on the Inflammatory Bowel Disease Committee of the North American Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition, which is the National Professional Organization for Pediatric Gastroenterology. While in Michigan, Dr. Sandberg developed an uh, interest in family perspectives surrounding inflammatory bowel disease surgery and wrote an NIH K08 application on the topic. He has multiple peer-reviewed publications regarding inflammatory bowel disease, he teaches and mentors medical students, residents, and junior faculty in pediatrics and internal medicine, as well as uh, MPH and MBA students. His main research and quality improvement interests include care of children with inflam inflammatory bowel disease, including hospitalization, immunosuppressant therapies, and decision support. Ladies and gentlemen, give a round of applause for Dr. Sandberg. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thanks for uh, my GI family coming out to support. I, I sincerely appreciate that. Um, and thanks for that introduction. Um, Shelton, neither Shelly nor I have some disclosures. Um, and I'll let her um, maybe introduce uh, herself in a minute. We're going to do some tag teaming here. I'm going to talk uh, for a few minutes, and then she's going to talk and uh, run us through uh, a tool that is a long labor of love uh, that we're excited to talk with you about today. The objectives of this talk are to understand the framework of shared decision making, uh, understanding where and when it's most appropriately used, to understand and give examples of how a parent partner can inform shared decision making in healthcare, and to identify a tool for shared decision making. So right up front, right, right at the very beginning, uh, we would be remiss without recognizing that this has been um, an incredibly large and engaged group of people that have come together to make this um, to make this tool that I'm that we're going to share with you. Um, this list includes uh, Dr. Soldis, a uh, pediatric surgeon here at Dayton Children's Hospital, it includes psychologists uh, both here and at Nationwide Children's, it includes 
uh, certified wound and ostomy nurses here at uh, Dayton Children's, um, GI nurses. We've got uh, folks from Improve Care Now, which is that quality improvement learning collaborative um, that was briefly mentioned before. Uh, these are specialists in engagement. Uh, we've got Dr. Duffy, who is um, you know, a local expert in shared decision making, whom we uh, tapped uh, for his expertise. We've got lots of uh, parent and patient groups uh, with, through Improve Care Now. Uh, we had support from senior leaders. We had financial support from um, external to the hospital. Uh, there was a lot of help from uh, DCH Marketing, Kim Quill in particular, uh, helping us, and many others that um, both Shelley and I were afraid that we're going to miss out on. So if, if we didn't list you and you did participate, thank you and my apologies for not for not putting your name on this. What is this? What is shared decision making? Well, it is decision making between clinicians and patients. It is selecting tests and treatments and care plans. It is based on available evidence and it balances the risks and the outcomes with patient preferences and values. And the, the pitch that I'll make here is that, um, you, you know, there are some times in medicine where you don't want shared decision making, right? So if you're in the operating room and the surgeon turns to, uh, you know, somebody and says, should I cut that? Uh, that's not really, you know, a shared decision making kind of an opportunity, right? That is, that is not what we're talking about. Um, there are times, though, when there are multiple options available and it's not clear what the correct option should be. Um, it's not uh, also always uh, what the doctor thinks, right, uh, is the best way forward. Um, and so it, you know, if you've, if you've got an individual who has very strongly held beliefs, for example, and the example here that I'll use is uh, vaccinations. So if you've got a family uh, that you know feels strongly about you know not vaccinating their child, you know you could take the hardline approach that says you know take it or get out. Um, but if you're you know if you're interested in the overall health of the child and you're interested in building a relationship and you know being willing to meet somebody. And every situation is different, right? This, I'm kind of painting broad strokes here. Um, but I, I would argue that there are some elements of shared decision making even in that vaccination discussion. Why would we do this? Why would we ever think uh, to do this? So when patients engaged in shared decision making, they learn about their health and they understand a little bit more about health outcomes. They recognize that a decision needs to be made. So this isn't just a information sharing session. They understand that we need we need to move forward. We need to make a decision to be able to go forward. They understand the pros and cons of different options. Um, they have the information and tools needed to evaluate their options. Um, and on this one in particular, and you'll see this as Shelley goes through the tool, um, you know, we at least you know, my biases as a physician, you know, I, I know risks and benefits and I, I can talk about that, but there are some times when um, people need other sources of information or support in order to make their decision. And one of the eye-opening moments that I, uh, um, that, that happened for me when we were in this, you know, journey together and process is that there was a patient that actually wanted to talk uh, with their spiritual leader. Uh, before making a decision of a colectomy uh, for inflammatory bowel disease. And so that was kind of an aha moment for me that said, oh, there might be you know, other people that they need to talk with. Um, they collaborate with their healthcare team instead of um, you know, dangerous silence of you know, not getting any information from uh, the patient or the family. They're actually willing to engage. They're willing to collaborate. They're willing to uh, chart a path forward. And they're more likely to follow through on that decision. So again, you're not having people run uh, to go to another institution, or you're not worried about you know, them running to another provider or running to um, you know a non-medical uh, provider of medical care. Um, you know they're they're more engaged. Uh, providers also like it. So 
Uh, they uh, indicate that patients are more knowledgeable about their disease process and they're open to dialogue, that they help uh, the patient understand what we're trying to say and what we're trying to do, that they build um, you know, a trusting relationship with their patients, and both patients and physicians uh, are satisfied at the end of the, of the experience. So when and where is it most effective? So I alluded to this um, you know, earlier. So clearly, when there is more than one reasonable option, uh, whether it's a screening option or a treatment decision option, that might be a, a time when you employ uh, tools of shared decision making. When no one option has a clear advantage, when the possible benefits and harms of each option affect patients differently. So for example, if you have a medication, a chronic medication that you would like to, to start, but it has a particular side effect that affects uh, folks with say, uh, immune problems differently than somebody without, then that's, uh, you know, that that's something that you might consider. Or another option here in our neck of the woods with inflammatory bowel disease, sometimes uh, we have to use steroids. And if someone has a severe, um, uh, you know, acne problems, that, that, you know, choice in steroid is going to seriously affect their acne. And so, you know, if they had an alternative to choose from, that might be a, a time when shared decision making might be helpful. Um, when else can it be uh, effective? When the patient or parent has strong values, uh, when the decision is affecting the mental health of the parent or child. So that was another kind of aha moment for me. Um, you know, one of the reasons why I love being a physician is that you get to interact with people who care about uh, growing kids and helping kids get better. Um, and for the vast majority of time, that includes parents. When a parent comes and it's clear that they're losing sleep over this decision, or they are scrambling and they're looking for other sources of information, or they are, they feel um, petrified and they're not able to even interact with you or they're able to make a decision, that might be, um, you know, a sign that, you know, this decision is triggering some anxiety or this, this decision is triggering some other aspect of mental health. Um, that uh, might be benefited by using kind of shared decision techniques. And so with that, I'm going to pause uh, and turn the mic over to um, my very wonderful partner, Shelly Daub. Um, before she introduces herself, I, I do want to say one thing, okay. and that is uh, she has been a fantastic partner to work with. Uh, she and I are very different people. And um, we have gained uh, mutual trust and respect of each other's uh, expertise and each other's strengths. Um, to this day, when I'm preparing a, a presentation, I, I always have uh, Shelly's voice in my ear saying ethos, pathos, uh, and all, all those things. Thank you for not saying so. loud voice in your ear. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Shelly and, and have her introduce herself. Thank you. Thank you. I, it's really, I can't tell you how fun it is to be back at Dayton Children's today and see friendly faces in the audience and some new faces too. Many of you know my story. For those of you who don't, I'm actually not a mother of two. I'm a mother of five boys. Two of them do have inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey. Um, but before I do, I want to kind of reflect back on some of what Dr. Sandberg has shared so far this morning and say, first of all, that you left me with this. Oh. <laughs> I am not allowed to be in charge of driving anything. When I talk, I just start talking. Um, I want to reflect back a little bit. Since I left Dayton Children's a couple of years ago, um, I've had some really wonderful opportunities to coach and be coached. And one of the things that I have learned and benefited most from in coaching applies today. And that is the saying that no two people think, act, feel, or choose alike. And so I want us to kind of frame our conversation today around the idea that every family 
um, even within the same family, two different parents and the child may all be uh, looking at their decisions from a completely different light and perspective, and they're trying to marry that together. And then you have a physician who is um, more than likely, because it's 2022, trying to do some sort of shared decision making with the patient. I mean, I think that we are um, in most situations long past the prescriptive medicine model, and we try to um, do shared decision making. But I think um, without a formal process, without a plan, it, it can look very different. It can fall to the wayside. And so I think what we want you to do today is just get you thinking about how you can better incorporate shared decision making in your practice. And so with that, I'm going to talk about my journey. Um, typically, when a parent speaks, they talk about their their um, children's journey. And my kids are adults. They're those, the two that have IBD are now 24 and 28. And I don't tend to share um, a lot of the trauma and difficulties that they have had because I want to respect them. Um, but my story and my journey is inextricably just tied with that. And so uh, you'll see bits of their story as you hear mine. Um, and so I'll start with being a parent. So I was a pretty young parent when my six-year-old was diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease. We lived in one of those big square states out west and went to a small children's hospital that was probably about the size of Dayton Children's in the 1970s or 80s. Um, when my son was diagnosed, I had never heard of Crohn's disease, didn't know what it was, knew we had some other family things going on, so wasn't sure how that all interacted. And what I got was a physician who said to me, here are some medications, here's a pamphlet, you're fine, just go home and deal with this. Um, those weren't the words, but that was the attitude. And so I took my son home, and he's on five ASAs, and he's on steroids, and things went from bad to worse. And um, I, I called, I, I, there was no shared decision making with this particular physician. Um, and so the Air Force in its great wisdom and due to my loud complaining, which I do sometimes, um, Dr. Mezoff says that um, my mom didn't raise any silent sufferers, um, but uh, the Air Force moved us to Texas um, because Wilford Hall is there. If any of you are affiliated with the Air Force, um, then you, you know Wilford Hall. And so I went there and the GI that we were assigned to said to me, you know, Shelly, I'm going to be honest. I've only treated maybe a handful of young children with IBD, but we're going to walk through this together and we're going to make decisions together. And, and I'm going to ask you and you're going to tell me what you think and we're going to work on this together. It was such a wonderful way to begin our medical journey. But the problem was that there weren't a lot of options in 2000. There were steroids, there were five ASAs, there were immunomodulators. Remicade hadn't been approved for pediatrics yet. And so surgery was the other option. And it kept being mentioned again and again over the years as my kids and I walked through this journey. A year after we got to Texas, my second son was diagnosed. The first was diagnosed with Crohn's. The second was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, and that led to all sorts of questions in this mom's mind about, do these doctors really know what they're talking about? Um, so three years later, the Air Force says it's time to move. We pick Cincinnati because Cincinnati Children's has a great inflammatory bowel disease center. And again, I connected with a physician who was just fabulous. By this time, because I had a great physician, I knew enough about inflammatory bowel disease that um, my physician at Cincinnati Children's invited me to sit on their family advisory council together. So I went from parent to partner, and it was a very short leap from being a partner on their advisory team to doing some co-designing and co-producing. We put together what became the largest IBD Family Education Day in the country, and CCF has modeled their programs after that. Um, we put together a mentoring program and um, a new diagnosis clinic and all sorts of things that were co-designed with physicians and nurses and parents. Um, back in the day, we didn't include a lot of patients. Uh, I think that's changing and I think that's a good change. So co-designer, co-producer, I'm working great with this physician. We have a wonderful relationship and tragically and horrifically, she. Um, 
died suddenly. And I was assigned to a new provider who had, again, a very prescriptive mode. Um, I think he tried to, sh to share decisions with me, but he had some pretty strong opinions. And I felt increasingly pushed towards the idea of surgery for my children, for both of them um, at the same time. Imagine how that feels. Uh, my kids had tried Remicade, they got serum sickness, they had tried Humira, they were non-responders, and the new generation of biologics hadn't yet been developed or wasn't ready for pediatric use. And so um, uh, I struggled. I struggled a lot going back to a prescriptive form of uh, decision making where I didn't feel like I had a voice. And uh, in 2009, I think my kids were hospitalized 10 times back to back. And during one of those hospitalizations, lo and behold, Dr. Mezoff walks into my hospital room and I latched onto that man like he was my lifeboat. Um, and so I changed my care uh, from this very prescriptive person to Dr. Mezoff because he truly, truly understood shared decision making. And you could see that from the beginning. Um, when we left the hospital and had our first clinic appointment with Dr. Mezoff, um, he didn't meet with my children that day. He met with me and we had a very strong, solid, but short and collegial conversation about how we were going to approach care for my children and what each of us, what our roles were and how he would lean towards evidence-based medicine and he would help me understand it. Um, we would look for solutions together. Um, that was a game changer for me. Um, that made me feel that I was moving from just being a partner and an advisor to truly being a colleague and an equal working with the staff to help my children get better. But they weren't getting better. I mean, I, I can't say that, that any of this has been a magic bullet. My kids were very, very sick for a very, very long time. Um, in 2017, Dr. Mazoff recruited me to come here and be a parent partner. And I did that for a couple of years and helped set up some of the advisory councils here and uh, helped to grow the hospital-wide advisory council here. And during that time, I reconnected with um, Dr. Saeed and, and I met Dr. Sandberg and I was reintroduced to Improve Care Now. And through that, I really began to see the value of not just a single parent or a couple of parents who have ideas, but really all parents have ideas and value and things that they can add to help us become better at this shared decision-making model. Um, I mentioned that I do some coaching and I'll go back to what I said earlier. Every person thinks, acts, feels, and chooses differently what a challenge for providers to figure that out. Well, all you wanna do is make a kid better and you maybe have a very short time for your clinic space. And that's why I think something like our shared decision um, a tool can be very helpful and developing this sort of thing for different disease processes can be very helpful in framing how you look at shared decision-making. Um, we mentioned our team earlier, but I, we wanted to give a shout out to kind of the numbers so you could see how vastly large this team was. We say 10 parents participated. That's probably here locally in Dayton. We also had parents from across the country through ICN looking at this tool and giving us input. Um, we had patients um, through Improved Care Now predominantly who gave us inputs. Um, you'll see when we look through the tool, a video that actually was uh, initially a Facebook post from a patient who had an ostomy talking about the anniversary of her ostomy. And we turned that into a video with her help. Uh, we worked with uh, psychologists and ostomy uh, care nurses and uh, marketing was a key part of this because we were very, very cognizant that we wanted to keep the reading level and the understanding level um, at about fifth grade. And so we would script everything with that in mind to make sure everyone um, had equal access to this tool. Um, and then our ICN partners, of course, were the ones who built the web tool for us. And um, so we had people from all over the country all coordinating and Dr. Sandberg and I were kind of the project managers and we, uh, it took about 18 months from start to finish to put this together. 
And that's maybe longer than you want to invest in something. But I think when you see what we created for less than $2,000, you'll be really impressed. All right, our goals were of course, uh, to increase patient involvement in shared decision making and to increase a multidisciplinary approach to IBD surgery. Um, when my sons were told they needed surgery, we were sent to a surgeon. That was it. I think maybe we were probably asked to go see psychology, but by that point, I was so stressed out and traumatized that when they suggested we go see psychology, I assumed they thought I was nuts. Maybe they did. Maybe I am. But um, it, it really influenced my ability to participate in that decision. Um, you'll kind of see we, we took a lot of inputs about feelings and fears and facts and fiction and, and put them all together um, and thought we were going to create simply an ostomy surgery tool. But as we talked more and more with the nurses on the team and the providers, we realized that um, I realized that not all IBD surgery is ostomy surgery. And so we really needed to address some of those different options as well. Um, I found online an Ottawa personal decision-making guide. It's, it's a similar tool to what we're using, but black and white and very basic and attuned to adults. And I think we used hysterectomy as our model because that is a surgery that people think is elective, but sometimes really isn't from the provider's point of view. Um, and then, uh, you know, we, we just kind of, we put it all together with illustrations and content and, and created this really lovely tool. For, so for the sake of time, I'm gonna have Dr. Sandberg move on. Um, in addition to the tool, Dr. Sandberg felt very strongly that we should have some sort of very simple paper tool that providers could take a glance at and look at so they know what they're getting into. Um, we wanted it to be accessible, but we needed providers to tell families about this tool and to encourage their use. And um, then we created actually, instead of a paper tool for our families, a web-based tool. All right, this is why I needed you to drive because you're gonna have to click through the links. You can't, oh no, my goodness, I have to drive. It's terrifying. I'm not good on the streets either. All right. Yep, oh, see, Kelly. <laughs> There we go. All right. So we call this the should I have IBD surgery tool. I'll let you help me out I then. Navigate this. I share the screen. There we go. So while he's navigating this a little bit, I'll tell you that um, because ICN gave us a grant for this project, this tool actually lives on the Improve Care Now website. Um, that's very intentional too, because that means that the over 120 care centers around the world that are part of ICN have access to this tool for their families. Um, we were very thoughtful about the format and making this a very uh, easy tool for kids to scroll through on their phone and just click things um, to move forward. We tried to keep the language incredibly simple. And you can see on the left that um, we decided that we first want them to identify what they know about their own inflammatory bowel disease. The next page is get the facts. This one took a little work on our part. You know, we're not web designers. No one on this team was a web designer. So uh, that also makes this kind of miraculous that we pulled it off. But we put together some, uh, some scroll over so that people could understand that there are really three different types of therapy that, that providers think about. Now, I think families would also add natural therapies to this, but we didn't go down that route. Um, we wanted to include some key things to know and just some basic information. We uh, pulled up some words like incontinence to make sure that, uh, I want to say students because I work at a university, but patients 
um, had the, the vocabulary that they needed to discuss this intelligently. You know, when you're in a GI meeting, everybody makes poop jokes, but I will tell you that in my family with five boys and IBD, nobody makes poop jokes. So my, my sons really wanted to know the, the proper language so that they could speak intelligently. Um, I'll move on here. We talked about comparing the options and um, created some charts so that the families can look at, you know, what the various option means, what's involved with them, what the benefits are, what the risks and side effects might be. And we made it so that as the um, as the patient goes through this, they can at the very bottom click and get to the next section. And we worked very intently for probably a few months on the idea of feelings and really tapped into our psychologists, one of whom is an inflammatory bowel disease patient who had an elective ostomy. Um, and her insights were just truly invaluable to us in putting this together. Um, you can see that we kind of tried to think through all of the things that patients and parents might be feeling or might be worried about, but don't feel like they have the, um, the platform or the voice or even the time to, to tell you about in a clinic meeting. And so um, I'm not, I, you can look at this later. I'm not going to belabor all of the things that we have on here, but we talked about what do you worry about? What are your concerns? What is important to you? Um, you know, sometimes it's simply a matter of timing. You know, maybe I know surgery is in my future and, and the physician feels like it's imminent, but I really want to get through prom or graduation or whatever before I approach this. We talked about support and Dr. Sandberg touched on this briefly um, in talking about a patient who wanted some spiritual support. I think um, in talking with families, I found that, you know, especially when mom and dad aren't um, living in the same household and maybe don't get along great, sometimes it can be hard for a patient to say, but I really want my other parent to have some input too, or I really want my grandparents because they pretty much raised me to be the ones who have input in this. So letting the patient say in a, um, in a format that is you know, easy and private that these are the people I want to help me out is super important. We even included things like um, high school guidance counselors because the student might want to know what's going to happen after I have my ostomy? How am I going to take care of this at school? Those may be things that if we answer those questions prior to surgery, um, we can make this a little easier for the patient. Now, having said that, I realize that a lot of ostomies happen emergently or urgently, and there may not be time to go through all of this. So our time frame was two. We wanted to introduce this a few months, right, Dr. Sandberg, before surgery if when possible there, yeah there were different yes yes all right perfect all right oh i and i didn't mention this but at the bottom we talked about second opinions um you all live in a world where second opinions are second nature to you but i'm going to tell you even as someone who's been an advocate for my children's health care for the last 20 plus years I have a doctor's appointment on Tuesday and I'm going to have to walk in and say I want a second opinion to a doctor that I've only met twice and I'm feeling a little nervous about that, right? It, it does feel from a patient's perspective a little uh, like we don't trust you or we don't believe you or we think you're not good enough and we don't want to say those words. So we put that option in here as well. Um, and then the last uh, section here is my decision. And we really just start asking some questions, not you have to make a decision today, but do you know why surgery is being recommended? Do you understand your options? Are you ready to make a decision? If not, when do you think you'll be ready to make a decision? What else do you need to know before you can make a decision? And then at the very end, the patient has the option to print this out and email it through my chart to their nurse or their provider so that their provider has these answers. 
And so in a nice, neat little package, the patient can provide everything that the provider needs to know about the thoughts and feelings and ideas that are going into their decision without having to have, you know, a deep probing and sometimes painful for teenagers conversation. I do not know how to get back to the other slide. Am I on the? Yeah, I'm gonna let you help me out. I am not wearing my glasses. That does not help with driving things. All right. All right. You can't. Okay, I'll get it. Um, so we talked about some simple steps for getting. Oh, we talked about some simple steps for getting started, um, because as I said earlier, I'm sure that you all work to share decisions with your patients as best you can. But without a framework, it can be a little bit tricky to do that. Um, one thing that you can do is simply invite a family in to be an advisor so that you can learn more about what the concerns are that your families face. Um, simple conversation starters might be, let's look at the options, let's come up with a plan together. Um, maybe research says we should do X, Y, or Z, and how do you feel about that? Um, even just asking a family, do you need to think about this? And just making sure they have all the information in a format that is understandable for them. Um, I think that in 2022, every physician should be addressing Dr. Google. You should probably be asking your patients when you diagnose them with diabetes or IBD or whatever, you know, have you looked this up? And what did you think? What did you learn? What are your concerns after looking this up? Because you and I know that you can Google a hangnail and be three clicks away from death. So you really need to know what your patients are afraid of because Google does inspire fear. And I would say also making sure that patients and families know what the recommended websites are. You're not going to you're not gonna discourage families from looking things up. What you want to do is encourage them to go to Mayo Clinic or Cleveland Clinic or Dayton Children's and look at those websites to get good information. Um, and then adding a parent to your team is so important. I mentioned earlier that part of my pathway was being a colleague. Well, part of that for me was working on staff here at Dayton Children's and being allowed to sit in the IBD population management meetings. Um, where the entire team comes around and talks about some of the more difficult cases each week. And I was allowed to kind of observe and listen and maybe add some thoughts and feelings and perspective from a family's point of view. Um, having a parent on your team, whether that means you're developing a tool or just getting some insights or maybe inviting them in a little deeper for a project or to co-produce something together, um, I think is an invaluable part of moving into this next um, century of medic medicine and making sure that every person in the room when you're discussing healthcare, has, that you've leveled the playing field and we all are part of that team and making decisions together. Um, and I would be remiss if I did not say that Dr. Sandberg would probably like to see some QI projects on shared decision making. Thank you, Shelley. So just um, to share with you a little bit of the impact that this tool has made. Uh, within a month, we asked uh, the Improved Care Now uh, folks to give us a, a flavor of who has at least used the tool, who's, who's seen the tool. And what came back was a little surprising. I think it was uh, seven countries, uh, about 80 centers or 80 unique um, uh, geographic places that they had, had seen here. And so, you know, and that's wonderful. And that was the purpose of, of that, uh, of creating this tool, not just for kids at Dayton Children's or at Cincinnati Children's or at Nationwide Children's or Ohio even, or the United States even, but this could be a tool um, that could be helpful for anyone uh, in the world with inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and so it is, uh, and a couple other things that I wanted to mention about the tool. Um, one is that, you know, that, that PDF uh, creator at the end um, was very purposeful. So we wanted uh, families to understand that none of their inputs were being saved on the website. 
uh, none of that input is you know controlled by um, you know a clinician or improved care now but that is all fully under the control of, of the patient and so they can choose whether or not to email that to their provider or not and I will say in my personal experience everyone has chosen to do that and I'm very grateful for that because then that shows um, or that allows uh, further partnerships and helping identify what connections need to be made I'll say most oftenly the connections that need to be made are primarily with uh, the family with an, a wound ostomy nurse. Um, just to talk about the cares of an ostomy and what that means and what that looks like and how am I going to play baseball or how am I going to go dating or how am I going to, you know, how does that look like? And the wound ostomy nurse has been a, a great uh, a value in that. But we're now ready to, uh, to research this tool. And so we have a current study, and Stephanie is here, uh, and colleagues here in the audience um, that is, is helping us with this. But we have a mixed method study uh, that's currently ongoing, uh, studying this tool's effectiveness. Um, the active portion right now is our provider study. Um, if you're interested, uh, you know, the, uh, the, there's some contact information for Stephanie there, as well as the actual tool or the study uh, for providers there. There's the other half of the study, which is a, a semi-structured interview uh, with patients and families that have used the tool uh, with interviews with, with psychologists. Uh, and so that's the second half of the study that we're almost ready to start. We're so very close uh, to that being started. Um, and with that, um, you know, here is our contact information. And uh, we'd love to answer any questions or hear any of your expertise uh, as we talk about shared decision making. Thank you. No one has a question. I got a question. <laughs> So in putting together this QI project, what was the biggest barrier from starting to getting it to where it is now? What was the biggest obstacle you had to overcome? You can go first. Mm -hmm. uh, so this, this was really first framed as a research project. It actually wasn't a quality improvement project. Um, there was a gap and there was a need uh, for this and you know when i first was was framing this as a ko8 award it was as a research project um, but as you know as life happens and you, you meet different people like like shelly and you find someone who's a great partner and you realize you know i, I don't have time or really the infrastructure support to do a ko8 and we've got this other way to do what we wanted to do a lot faster uh, and with a lot less money and a lot less time required, I actually think, you know, 18 months is an incredible fast, amount, you know, incredible short amount of time to get something up and running versus if we were to go the research route, this would have taken five to 10 years. Um, and so your question is an interesting one. I think, um, it, you know, some of the barriers are also the opportunities. So, and what, I, what do I mean by that? So there are many, many key stakeholders in this particular subject matter area. And so getting that number of inputs takes a long time. So you could look at that as a barrier, but I also, on the flip side of that, look at that as a great success and a great strength that we've had all of these people, you know, all of this, these experts uh, input into. Um, I think uh, there were times that both of us needed uh, kind of a, um, uh, a relighting of the fire or a uh, um, a focusing uh, towards targets. So at times it was really fun to riff on ideas and then realize, oh wait, we've got a deliverable that we need at the end of this. So staying on task sometimes was uh, was a challenge. But I've I've talked enough. Shall, shall oh no, I would say? say that is key. Um, I became kind of the de facto project manager. I mean, Dr. Sandberg kept me in line and that has to happen because one of my strengths is ideation so we could still be doing this like in 20 years we could still be doing this because i have some perfectionistic uh 
traits. And um, Dr. Sandberg was wonderful to kind of just help me rein some of those things in and keep us going. So I would say we were good co-managers together. Um, I think the other thing too is that when you start a project with families, um, you really don't know what direction it's going to take. And um, sometimes it is within that QI realm and you can you can move that. If I hadn't already worked at Dayton Children's and known a little bit about QI, it might have been harder for us to to corral those ideas. Um, sometimes when you invite a family into the fold, they want to do things that maybe don't fall within clinical practice. They Maybe they want to gather lotions and pass them out on the, the floors or you know do some nice things for families. That can be a great starting point for a volunteer, but that's probably better housed under volunteer services. And so knowing when to refer people to another partner within the hospital, like patient experience, or um, volunteer services for the strengths and the ideas that they want to contribute can be super helpful too. Oh, thank you. Did you have any thoughts on what part of the tool are working well and what's not? And was there any idea of adding feedback as they're completing the tool to see what worked well for them and what still needs to be added? Yeah, great. Uh, a great question and, and great feedback. Um, so there is an area on uh, the research. Uh, uh, there's an open ended question at on the end of both the provider survey and uh, within the context of the um, of the interview questions that ask for specific feedback. Um, we did give uh, about 10 months of time to gather some of that feedback as well. Uh, I think we debated about whether or not just to you know, leave a little uh, thing on the website that says if you have feedback, please give it here. Um, but ultimately decided to fold that into the re part of the research uh, question. We wanted to capture that in a systemic way and make sure that you know, it wasn't just uh, a, a single voice that was being amplified, but it was a theme that naturally bubbled up before we were to make changes. One of the, you know, one of the temptations would be is to take this tool and to keep tweaking it uh, and then to change it so many times uh, to where it's not recognizable from, you know, from, uh, from a previous version standpoint. And so we wanted to avoid the temptation of uh, making, you know, continuing to make changes uh, and capturing it in a more systemic, thoughtful way. So, so great question. It is a question we did, uh, we did consider, and I, I think we've plotted a course that uh, makes the most sense for its its long term use and benefit. I think I would add to that too. Um, my background is as an educator, and so I was I was very aware that we were already asking a lot of kind of sensitive and probing questions of teenagers. And we it, you'll notice as you go through the tool that we didn't ask any open ended questions. We wanted it to be a very easy just kind of click through things. And so I'm not sure that we could have. Um, created a question that provided any valuable feedback in that format without it being an open ended question. But we really did want to respect their space and the fact that by the time they got to the end of this tool, they were probably um, finished as teenagers talking about their feelings. Kelly and Shelly, this is Don Doobie. Hello, Ms. Dr. Doobie. I don't know if you folks can see the chat, but our good friend Ellen Burke from Oxford, Ohio has a couple of questions in the chat. Let me see You're if I can see those. Pull those up. Thank you, Dr. Doobie. Let me see if I can. I can't read from all the way over there. Right. Does that say chat right there? That's yep. more. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I can't even read that. Hang on a second. We're a mess. I could read them for you. Oh, that would be fabulous. So couple of questions that Ellen has. What criteria do you use to determine if a child needs surgery for IBD? And is the quality of life improved after surgery? And how often are osteotomies used after surgery? I'm going to let you, you go start first, with the you. criteria. <laughs> sure. Uh, so um, there is there. So I'll say this. There is not a national standard that is clear and universally accepted is number one, uh, which 
you know, again, makes a sense why we're talking about a shared decision making tool when that's the case. Uh, we can't get surgeons to agree, let alone GI, you know, IBDologists to agree on those criteria. Um, and so I will share with you kind of my criteria. And that is after someone has failed uh, their first line of therapy, I will bring that up as an option. Now, uh, the way that I frame that, it's not the first option. So after someone, say, fails uh, infliximab or Remicade, I will bring that up as an option. Um, there are some aspects, too, that change those recommendations. So for example, if someone has Crohn's disease, um, we know that if, uh, through sad experience, that if you continue to do surgery on small bowel Crohn's disease, you continue to take pieces of small intestine out of a person, there eventually will be no small intestine left and they will end up with TPM the rest of their life. And so, um, you know, knowing their disease phenotype, so if someone has stricturing Crohn's disease, for example, um, you know, as a clinician, I'm going to put up surgery a little bit higher than I normally would, knowing that, you know, if there's a, you know, a small segment that is refractory to disease and it's symptomatic and, you know, they would benefit by having a, a limited surgical resection, then that, you know, bumps up as to how I, as a clinician, um, you know, promotes that option among other options. Um, I think if somebody has ulcerative colitis, so there's a lot of data uh, now um, suggesting that women who undergo colectomies for ulcerative colitis have a much, um, have many more uh, complications with fertility in their lives. And so these decisions, as they are happening in teenage years or younger, also needs to be balanced when we're talking about, you know, a potential uh, a decision for surgery that could affect their lives other than just in the GI realm. Um, so, so it's complicated is the short answer to that. That's why you need a clinician. That's why you need an IBDologist. That's why you need someone who knows that literature, who knows um, these side effects to help, you know, inform those decisions. And so it is, it is complex and it is nuanced. The second part, quality of life improved after surgery. So I will tell you, and I, I imagine there are some of my GI colleagues in the audience who will share that each of us has uh, probably multiple stories of a family uh, with a child with ulcerative colitis uh, that were hating life because you know they're having 20 bowel movements a day, half of them bloody. Every two weeks you're in the hospital getting transfusions or TPN uh, on and off steroids. And um, when they have, uh, you know, the colectomy, their quality of life does improve because the quality of life was so horrendous to begin with that pretty much anything is an improvement. Um, there are, and, and, you know, there is no one size fits all here. Each, you know, what, what Shelley said earlier really does hold true. There are plenty of times, too, when someone undergoes a surgery whether it be for inflammatory bowel disease or having a gallbladder out or something like that, and they realize, oh, I didn't have quite those expectations. Like, I didn't realize that life was still going to be four to six bowel movements a day without my colon or without my gallbladder and, um, you know, those things uh, as well. So uh, the answer to the second question, I think, also is it depends, um, <laughs> which is probably not a very satisfying answer. Um, but it's it's a reason why you need shared decision making and why you need both partners um, talking of a parent and a, and a clinician together to help make some of those decisions. Well, and I would interject there too and say that uh, and keep in mind, I was having these conversations with um, people in, you know, between 2005 and 2010 predominantly. Uh, but through my volunteer work with the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, I knew many, many, many people who had ostomy surgeries. Some had had a reversal. Some had decided to keep their ostomy. And everybody's story was different. Some were very happy with their ostomies. Others were very not happy with their ostomies. Um, and I think um, that's why you have to really take into account all of the preferences of a person.
And uh, I didn't mention this, but my sons never had surgery. Um, we actually rode out the storm and it was rough, but in my opinion, it was probably not any rougher than it would have been having two teenage boys with ostomies trying to figure out how to manage that. Um, and then when the new uh, generation of biologics came along, we found our magic bullet and they're now um, healthy, happy 20 somethings who still have their colon and have never had any IBD surgery. Thanks for sure, Michelle. So oh, this seems like a very useful tool and a helpful project, but uh, I'm thinking of a population that might be difficult to get to. So uh, there's two questions, really. Have you encountered, well, I imagine this would be difficult for people who have very limited literacy or healthcare literacy or access to reliable internet because it is like a website. So the question is, have you encountered families in those situations? And then what have you done to remedy those complications? Oh, love that question. The answer is yes. Within the last week, we've had someone like that. And, um, you know, we have a, a great benefit of having um, Liz Yarger, who is our APP uh, that works uh, inpatient, and whether it was her or if, whether it was Jessica, who's another APP that works with us in patients, somebody went alongside a family, printed out, or maybe this was over the weekend, so guys, for, for, forgive me if I'm not giving credit where credit is due, but um, you know, we printed out a paper copy of this, went through it with the family, helped them identify you know, the gaps and the needs, and then were able to connect that back uh, with the primary uh, physician who could then uh, kind of act on it. Um, so was it ideal? No, it wasn't ideal. Um, if you have someone completely illiterate, um, you're going to have to, you know, come alongside them and, and walk through them with that. And, you know, the physician who's having, you know, uh, the primary uh, physician probably isn't the best person to do that, right? You might want, say, a social worker or you want someone who is kind of a little bit disconnected from the, the primary forces in, in role in stake here. To, to walk them through that, um, but it's still it's still usable. It still it still has value. Um, would it be great? And oh, and the other thing, you know, Shelley had mentioned that this was formulated at a, a fifth grade reading level, and for Ohio, that really has helped make the tool more accessible. So there are relatively few um, uh, patients that I've encountered here at Dayton Children's that are completely illiterate. Um, as opposed to, um, you, you know, understanding at a fifth grade level, mo most, most patients and families are able to do that. Um, we talked about, you know, a little bit related to this is translation. So, you know, Spanish language, uh, other language uh, translations uh, of that, um, you know, that was uh, brought up kind of early on in, in this process as well. We would love to be able to get to a point that we're able to not just um, translate the words, but also translate the cultures here as well, because a lot of this is kind of swallowed up in the culture. So just because it's in Spanish doesn't mean it's culturally appropriate for someone from Central America, for example, versus South America versus Mexico. Um, so yes, and our, our psychology team is, is all over that, right? They're, they're very excited um, for that possibility as well. Great question. I just want to add, it was um, Suzette Grindle, our wonderful resident, who printed that off and used that with the family. So that was a wonderful resident. So I just want to give yeah. you credit because she did that. <laughs> thank you, Liz. And, and thank you for doing that. I hope that was a, a meaningful experience for you, too, uh, as part of your training. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for, for being here and uh, for engaging. Much, much appreciated.